All right, there we go. Hello. Welcome tonight to um, one of, I assume, a, um, first of many workshops uh, for this uh, semester, although I believe there have already been one or two before this. Um, tonight, tonight I'm in charge. So first of all, I want to say there are five of you there. So I don't see any reason why we couldn't be more social with this, you know, or we couldn't have more of a, a general conversation um, and be more open and stuff. So first of all, I'd like to encourage all of you to turn your cameras on and to join this small group <laughs> um, and uh, also to jump in with questions whenever you want. Um, don't don't feel worried about like um, interjecting or interrupting me or asking a question right away. There's only five of you. So like seriously, you don't need to um, we don't need to um, rely on formality here. Um, like I said, just jump in whenever you want, okay? <clears throat> with a question about anything. Well, specifically related to video games and the topic that we're discussing. Um, tonight, I'm going to show you a broad rundown on the types of jobs um, that you can have in video games. This is not a full list. It's really more of a general introduction. I consider doing a full list, but I'd have to go so fast that I don't think I could do it all in one hour and it would be kind of silly. Um, so uh, I'm hoping that something on this list will maybe inspire you to consider a job in games. Now, I know some of you are already doing that. Some of you are already in the program, Eve, I believe, right? You're in my game, my intro game class. So hopefully you have some idea of what it is that you're going to do um, in a career in games. Um, but for those of you who don't have any idea at all or are just thinking about it or considering it, this is going to be a great rundown for you. <clears throat> now, who am I? Why am I doing this? Okay, so I'm a narrative director right now, um, which is kind of a uh, leader type position uh, at a studio uh, involving narrative, game writing, um, narrative design, story design, writing, dialogue, all, all of that combined together. Uh, managing all the development of narrative features, any narrative storytelling feature, um, all that kind of thing, all wrapped into one now. I've been doing it for about 15 years. I've worked on some really fun games. I've been very lucky, actually, in my career to be able to work on so many interesting projects. I suppose that might be uh, somewhat related to the fact that I've always been involved in narrative, which means I'm always involved in games that have a big story to tell or a cool world or something like that. Uh, only towards the very end of my career did I jump into doing um, anything on mobile. Before that, I've been like a PC and a console adventure game nerd, as you can see. Um, but I recently tried uh, working in Battlefield Mobile. That was the last game I worked on before the one I'm currently on. And that was a real shift for me. That was jumping into an area that I knew absolutely nothing about um, and really enjoyed it. Now I work at Rogue Harbor, which is a tiny, like I would almost say boutique game studio downtown in downtown Vancouver. Um, where I'm the narrative director, a role I have sought uh, all my career and finally have landed it um, at this uh, tiny little indie Vancouver game studio right downtown um, on Water Street. It's like the perfect, it's like the dream come true. Um, and I cannot tell you anything about what I'm working on there because as you may or may not know, uh, game studios usually, typically are highly secretive about what they're doing until it's announced and our game is not announced. So it shall remain a secret for now, but trust me, 12-year-old Jeffrey would be very jealous of me right now. <clears throat> so let's do this. Um, tonight, I'm going to, well, first of all, we're going to watch this video. This is the most recent cinematic and game, well, it's a gameplay trailer for Assassin's Creed Mirage, a new game that's coming out in the Assassin's Creed series. It pretty well represents just about every single field broad field that you can get into in video games. And not only that, it's heckin' rad. So um, I'm going to let you just watch this. And I sure hope the audio is working. Tell me. Tell me that you can hear it. I'm oh, hold on a sec. It's glitching on me. We'll start again. From the beginning. Can you hear it? Good. Welcome, Hidden One. You have died and been reborn. We need to 
find a way to get you inside without being seen. You could bribe the guards to look the other way. I shall see what flavor best suits me. Embrace the fear. Quiet it. Find a stillness. And let's go. Stage is yours, Basim. We will be watching. Pretty great trailer all around. Uh, narrated by what's her name from The Expanse. Uh, she was the elderly politician in The Expanse. So great. Anyway, we're going to come back to this regularly um, through the night. But for the moment, that's that's the trailer. So now the cool thing about that trailer, like I said, is that just about every major field in video game, every major sort of um, department, we would say, uh, is represented pretty, pretty well. Of course, um, you can never see engineering. They're the secret. They're the, they're the secret ones. They're the hidden ones. Um, but I will point out to you. Uh, where where their influence is clear. <clears throat> so, as if this wasn't obvious, I would like to stress that games are made by people, for the most part. Um, designers, artists, narrative people, engineers, audio people, hybrids, and we'll get to that later on tonight, producers, and uh, UI and UX experts. Who, who sadly don't have a normal title. You, you can say UI designers, user experience designers. Um, that's a common enough, common enough term. All right, so these are what we would think of as, or the end of when we're in the office. This is like the team, right? Every game is made up of usually some combination of these eight groups, sometimes more. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but these eight are the main ones. When you talk about which team you belong to, it's usually one of these eight. So now we're going to go through every single one of these in detail. And I will tell you um, jobs that are common, commonly commonly found jobs in each of these departments, things you can easily um, you know, uh, seek once you got a, a proper education in it and some experience and some firsthand knowledge of video games. Um, all of them are achievable. Uh, and I mean, like many of them have entry level positions all the way up to running the whole flip in place. So uh, let me let me let me run you. So I'm going to we're going to go by all of them. And I'm going to tell you what you saw in that video um, that each one of these people is responsible for. So this would be a great time for you to interrupt me whenever you want, ask a question, um, anything you want to know in more detail about any of these. That said, we're gonna have to move a little quick because I have 30 or so slides and uh, about 25 jobs or so. So that's not going to give us a whole lot of time. But please do, like I said, interrupt and ask a question if you want to know more. And please, somebody turn the camera on. I'm so lonely. I'm all by myself here. And a wall of black covered in white names. Actually, the, the Zoom uh, panel here with all of your names on it looks more like some kind of memorial stone than it does like a party that I'm in. So sad and lonely. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say Etchy. It's Eche. Eche? Yes. Nice, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. All right. Oh, Megan's coming. Cool. Eduardo. Eduardo is in my, you're in narrative design. You're in uh, narrative and storytelling game design class right now, which is my favorite class. Yep. Eve is in intro game design right now. Hello. Um. Yeah, Michael, Janelle, join us if you can. Here we go. Took a little poke. Janelle and friend. Hello, nice to see you all. Okay, let's let's go. 
And uh, if you feel like you're gravitating towards one of these areas, please feel free to ask questions, of, you know, to get some more detail on them. Okay, designers. Designers, uh, at, um, the three jobs that I'm going to um, uh, run you by are, we would say, game designers, level designers, and I'll say engagement designers, which actually is a relatively new position. But I'll tell, I'm telling it to you anyway, because it's starting to become very common. Okay, so a game designer, they they come up with, you know, like innovate, um, uh, imagine from scratch all of the game's playable features. Um, lit literally, everything that you can do in the game has been conceived of by a game designer, usually right out of their own imagination, <laughs> slash looking at every other game that's been made and trying to figure out how to make them better. So they will start by prototyping and testing their ideas, usually directly in the game software. But I have to tell you, a great deal of it comes from writing a lot of documentation, a lot, a lot of planning, right, writing endlessly, huge amounts of documents, as Eve will uh, attest to, uh, currently in intro game design, where we are chiefly learning how to write documents to plan out our ideas. And Eduardo has already gone through probably too much of that already for his own taste. Um, you will, uh, yeah, so like I said, it's uh, planning and imagining, for the most part, the mechanics and systems that the player will use to engage in the game. So um, their main responsibility is basically to make the game fun. That's that's their whole job. And um, you'll see, like, in the top right picture here, we've got a picture of Bossom running as fast as he can. Running is a feature that a game designer probably wrote a document on at Ubisoft. Um, probably the 900th version of the running document that's been made by Ubisoft game designers. Um, but in that document, they would have said he's going to, um, he'll have these movement speeds, probably creeping very slowly, probably walking very slowly, um, jogging, sprinting, um, climbing, um, all, all of those things. Uh, um, and then all the other, and of course, it's stealth game, this game. So sneaking, hiding, attacking from behind cover, all of that, and so much more. Um, game designers, like I said, are really in a lot of ways responsible for sort of 90% of what you can do in a game. So if you do this, <clears throat> if you're interested in this type of role, it is best to become intimately familiar with a lot of the engines that are very uh, commonly used in games, especially Unreal and Unity. Those are the two big ones. There are lots of other ones. And of course, many studios make their own engines and their own editors from scratch. Um, for instance, I worked on at um, Square Enix, sorry, not Square Enix, Eidos in Montreal for a while, and they had their own engine completely made from scratch. Um, obviously, most of the engines are, I'm not going to say ripoffs, but I mean, they're like really close to uh, Unity and Unreal. I mean, Unity itself is, like took a great deal of inspiration from Unreal. So once you know how to use these two engines, especially, you're, you're well on your way to being able to know how to design and prototype all kinds of features in game. But like I said, an enormous amount of documentation and planning up front mm -hmm. and just meetings, so many damn meetings. All right, now, a level designer is related. Um, typically, I'm getting pinged continuously of people who want to join the meeting, including two people, both named Olivia Choi. That's amazing. It's incredible that two people with the same name would join the meeting at the exact same time. What a world. Okay, so level designers are a related concept, but more specific. They do a lot of different things, and there's a couple different varieties of them, but the most common variety of person we would call a level designer is someone who comes up with the physical architecture of a level uh, or does what we would call a block out, which is lays out the rough overall gameplay space of a level, of an area where a player can play. There are a lot of different varieties of this, of course, uh, all based on the different types of games that are made nowadays. For instance, in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, or sorry, in Assassin's Creed Mirage, a game that hasn't come out yet, um, I assume that it's going to be an open world game because they always have been. So 
a lot of the time in that game in games like that a lot of this environment is all like procedurally generated by like a fancy ai basically um and not a whole lot of it is laid out by hand <clears throat> in that case you would have a slight variant of what we would call of, of a level designer of what we would call a mission scripter so they would go in and like script in all of the story events all the gameplay objectives everything that you had to do to complete missions or different objectives they would go in and like script that stuff using a scripting language of some sort typically the a visual scripting language um, such as blueprints used in unreal or or other things like that similar things that is a skill that you'll have to learn because it is difficult to do otherwise on your own so they'll um, trigger all kinds of events um, they'll place the enemies They'll set up and design complicated battles that are not just completely ruled by the rules of the open world stuff going on. Um, yeah, anything that really needs bespoke setup, basically. Now, a level designer, you would say, is responsible for making the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay fun. What are you actually doing as you're running through a level or doing something um, specific? Um, and like I said, sometimes they really are placing these giant styrofoamy looking blocks and setting up the world's gameplay space. Later on, a level artist will come through and like add the beauty, you know, put the trees in, um, make the beautiful brickwork and all the other stuff that I'm sure is gonna make Mirage an unbelievably beautiful game. A level artist typically comes in and kind of paints over um, all of this uh, uh, boring shoebox stuff. If you were like really into making dioramas as a kid or like gluing boxes together and calling it a city, you should be a level designer. You will, if you are a level designer, you'll spend an immense and endless amount of time working directly in the engines that I just listed, Unreal and Unity. That's your bread and butter, is working directly inside the engine um, and putting stuff together. There are so many different varieties of this. Now, Engagement Designer is another one that I listed, but in fact, I'm going to bring that one up later in the hybrid section, because it's a little bit different. Any artists in the group? People thinking they're interested in game art? There is a huge variety of different um, art jobs available in games, ranging from the most straightforward fine art type thing uh, all the way to incredibly technical and complicated stuff. Uh, concept artist is one, environment artist. I, I mentioned earlier, like a level artist, um, kind of similar 3D modeler, texture artist, lighting artist. VFX artists and animators, all kind of counted typically in the art department. Sometimes the animation stuff gets its own department, depending upon, you know, how broad the needs are for animation. So a concept artist is in a lot of ways the most straight one to one fine arts to video games uh, step that you can take. Um, you use typically traditional art methods to imagine and then develop uh, to illustrate and to help flesh out for the whole rest of the team what stuff looks like and a lot in a lot of ways what it should feel like worlds characters situations such as the one um below here and uh we'll come back to that in a minute uh they help the other developers to envision the game overall to sort of get a sense of what the feel of it is going to be like and the mood or, but in essence really it's about instilling beauty into the game so that the game's aesthetic visual aesthetic is like you know as um, painfully beautiful to look at as possible. Make big feelings happen in the player based on the things they see. Like I said, um, this is the most one-to-one -one sort of traditional arts thing that you can do. You don't even have to, you don't even have to have all that much in the way of technical experience to do a concept artist. In fact, I feel a lot of kinship with technical, with, uh, with concept artists because writers and concept artists tend to be the least technically advanced people in the studio in terms of like tools and stuff that we know how to use and work on. And so uh, we hang out a lot while all the other like, you know, smarter people uh, make the video game. <laughs> so that said, you'll still use a lot of software like Photoshop, Painter, Procreate and Sketchbook Pro. Right before this meeting, I checked in with uh, a friend of mine who was a concept artist um, at Ubisoft during the Assassin's Creed Black Flag era. And this was the list that he gave me of tools to know. Now, environment artist 
is so is uh, sometimes uh, kind of like a form of concept artist, depending on exactly what they do. But <clears throat> there's another kind of form of it where they go in after the level designers have made those like ugly styrofoam block levels, and they just make it look like a real place by adding all of the cool details. Um, the, the plants, the, the, the wall shapes, um, different you know, like the lamps, they do a crap load of set dressing, making it all just look like a real actual place. Um, I am, uh, um, uh, I'm selling out the lighting artists in a statement like that, because as you can see with all of these shots, the lighting is obviously a huge part of the enjoyment of the whole place, the colors and the um, the vibe of the time of day and stuff like that. that. That is lighting artists. But all of the objects you see, like that cool scaffolding and the like cool looking green dome thing and all that, a lot of that stuff would have been like an ugly block before a level artist came in and replaced it with cool looking models. Um, sometimes the models that the level artists will add to the game are themselves also gray and and uh, have no texture to them. They have no like paint job on them. That's somebody else's job sometimes. And I'll explain that in a second. So this combines a lot of traditional and modern art skills as well, but also 3D modeling. You're making the objects. You're, you're replacing the ugly blocks and putting in a, a beautiful temple or, you know, a magnificent mosque like you see here or those cool or that's cool scaffolding. Um, and where a level designer has placed a flat area, uh, an environment artist will come in and like put in a cool looking pool and a fountain and a bunch of pl plants and other things like that to fill it out and make it look nice and real. You'll also work with lighting artists a lot and texture artists. And between the three of you, the entire mood of the playable game space is developed. So there's a lot of different software that these people will use. Um, Maya, ZBrush, 3ds Max, Blender, Substance Painter, all kinds of different stuff um, to get the, the looks that you're seeing here and much more. A great deal of it is also done directly in Engine these days, or right in Unreal, or right in Unity. Now, if, why is there a happy face on there? Who did that? I didn't do that. Did one of you do that? Why the heck? What? Some kind of ghost on there. Why are you able to draw on my screen? Well, you have a dark power now, so use it wisely. Okay. Um, moving on. <laughs> 3D modelers. Make the objects. Make the characters. Make the rad armor. Sometimes make buildings and stuff. But like I said, that's sometimes more a, a more specific job. The environment artist or level artist. Um, but the beautiful armor and the... Uh, um, clothing and stuff that you see here, and this amazing sword, all from Assassin's Creed Mirage, uh, would have been made by a modeler at some point, uh, a, a prop artist, potentially, with the sword, uh, and a character artist, potentially, with the character here. And there are many sub-varieties of these things, um, of a modeler, basically. A modeler is like an incredibly vague term, really. Um, you would mod often would end up specializing in modeling something, Weapons, guns, characters, buildings, crops. That's about it, really. Those are the main ones. Can I ask something? Yeah, please do. Uh, does modelers design the characters as well? I'm kind of interested in being a character artist too. You could do both. You could design. You could do the concept art of the sword, for example, um, and then you could possibly also be the modeler. Go directly in and make it. It depends how big the game is. Uh, well, how big the game is tends to dictate how specialized the team is. So sometimes you may have one person who, who does like 19 different things. For instance, on my on the job that I'm doing right now, I'm like the lead writer, the, nar the narrative director, uh, the project manager, and a whole bunch of other things simultaneously because our team is microscopic at the moment. Um, but a game like uh, Assassin's Creed Mirage could very likely have up to or even over a thousand people that end up working on the game directly, actually making assets for the game. And most of them are artists. So um, in a game of that size, it's more than likely you would be like specifically someone who concepted weapons. You would paint and draw the images 
of what of what the weapons should look like, doing tons of research and trying to you know make authentic decisions and stuff. Um, or you'd be the person modeling them. That's because the game is massive and they need to have an incredible amount of throughput, right? They need to generate tons of stuff, tons of assets. Um, and so um, when there's tons of work to do like that, they tend to uh, make you be like, make you specialize. So they hire people that specialize in doing certain things, such as um, a hard surface, a hard surface artist would be somewhat a fancy term for someone who would have made this sword. They would have done all the texturing. They would have done all the modeling. They would have done all the shaping, all that. So it depends. Thank you. It depends mm -hmm. on the on the size of the project you get into. Uh, yeah, buildings, furniture, weapons, characters. I think I listed all of it, basically. I say furniture, but like imagine set dressing and everything. And characters doesn't necessarily mean people. You could be making animals or, you know, anything. Anything that's a character that moves in the game. Now, a 3D modeler has, like the level artist, a technical and artistic skill set, often involving these things, ZBrush, Maya, Blender, and 3ds Max. But there are many more that are appropriate, and every team uses something different. In fact, most games nowadays, you can have people using all of these, or more, using even their own tools that they want. Um, and all that stuff is tends to be pretty effectively universal. You just import from wherever, um, whatever you're making. The tools are impressive nowadays. Texture artist, which was mentioned. Sorry, can I ask a question about yeah. 3D modeling? Yeah. Um, I'm in 3D animation, so I would like to know the difference between modeling it for feature films versus like games. Well, um, the, the only significant difference, uh, and in fact, sometimes there isn't any difference at all because the if we have a cinematic in the game like the one you're seeing right here um it, it could be virtually identical to uh, what you would need for a movie the only real big difference is that once a model gets into the game it has to have uh, it has to be um we would say like optimized for a nice level of performance with the game the game often is calculating um continuously uh, a, a proper presentation of the game we call that real time. It's in, in real time, right? It's um, real time optimization. Whereas a movie is what we would call pre-rendered. And this cinematic is pre-rendered as well. A pre-rendered movie doesn't require a computer to constantly be thinking about what it's doing, um, calculating the light, um, sometimes doing a lot of extra fancy stuff like um, making the fabric dance around while the hand moves around. In a movie, you've pre-rendered all of that, meaning it's all like you just you just generate it into a movie and there it's done. Um, when you do that, uh, all of that complicated calculation happens beforehand and can take a very long time, take like days to, to pre-render out some scenes for movies and stuff. Um, that's because there's just so much to figure out. And because it doesn't have to be rendered live on the player's computer or on their Xbox or something, they can do all the hard work in advance. And, we, and you know, sitting at the studio pre-rendering something, it doesn't matter that it takes like 17 hours for it to load. Whereas that is not acceptable in a video game, right? We, we can't let a video game take that long to load. So <clears throat> you have to make sure that the um, graphical quality that you're putting into a video game uh, is suitable for the machine and the hardware that you're making it for. So often the result is that the quality of visuals we see in a video game is not quite as good as what you can achieve in a movie. But damn, it's getting close. Very close. Look at Starfield. Holy cow. Shoot me now. So, a texture artist makes the 2D textures, the flat surface art, basically. So, this wonderful texture that you see on the wall was done by a texture artist. The floor that you see that Basim is hopping onto here, all painted by a texture artist. It is um, partially a traditional skill, right? 2D art skills are definitely a must for this type of role. Um, but so is photography uh, and some other technical skills as well. I have I, I constantly hear about like texture artists going on like, oh, we just went on a trip to Paris to photograph walls. Um, and that totally happens all the time. Just about every game I've been on, the texture artists end up like going to the actual location where the game is set and like spending three weeks in Budapest or something like taking photos of the ground. So um, that's that's totally normal. 
And then sometimes they take, they literally take those photos and put them in the game uh, or use them as inspiration to make the textures. So uh, they're also responsible for some really complicated technical stuff like setting the reflectiveness, um, what happens when that, when that uh, material becomes wet, when it rains or something. Um, does it look bumpy, even though it's utterly perfectly flat? Stuff like that. There's some technical stuff that's real fancy these days. So you end up using a lot of in-engine tools. Substance Painter seems to be one of the favorites, um, an Adobe program that people are in love with right now. But there are other ones. A lighting artist. Like you see going on with the lighting changes in these shots. creates lighting schemes basically like if you can imagine uh working at a, a like a theatrical theater setting up the lights and setting up different colors of lights and combinations of lights to light a scene um uh, very much like you would do in a movie for cinematography um they create lighting schemes you set and position lights in the scene um you design and develop lighting systems such as dynamic time of day like like you see going on in some of these shots um, especially this one where you see like the sun kind of pass over and change color and the whole vibe of the place changes. Um, this can be highly technical. It is still artistic. You still make a lot of decisions about cinematography and how to make things look nice, but you're also spending a lot of time designing and to some degree programming systems, more likely scripting systems, to make lighting like this happen, especially real time dynamic lighting like like the stuff you see on the bottom here um the light moving across the sky changing the whole feel of the environment that is a lot of the uh purview of lighting lighting designers and lighting artists these days however they still do a lot of stuff like picking what color the light's going to be there are a lot of complicated tools but a lot of them are in engine directly now um if you're in unreal a lot of the lighting that you're going to use is directly in that in, in that engine. But there's a lot of other stuff that you can use depending upon what your exact application is. Now, VFX art, VFX artist. I'm going to point it out here. See the dust, the blood, the dust, the birds, that craziness of like the blue glowy effect that's materializing on the enemies as he jumps through the air that are those are all visual effects every every one of those is a visual effect the birds probably are a visual effect dust is a visual effect do you see how also the the screen kind of bends and warps on the edges that's a visual effect okay so what about on this one uh the big purple the big red blast when he throws down the dust to escape, that's a visual effect. So the VFX artist creates and designs and um, you know um, illustrates uh, these visual effects in the game. Blood, weather, dust, special UI effects, flocks of birds, lens effects, particle effects like sparks, sometimes even plants. Um, plants are sometimes often basically just a visual effect. Uh, made to look like it's a real thing that's there. This is a very serious blend of technical and art skills. Uh, some effects you'll see are like so unbelievably creatively, beautifully artistic. They could only have been made by someone who has like a, a, a great visual imagination. Uh, but they combine it with a lot of technical skills to make it work inside a game is an intense level of technical skills, scripting and stuff. Again, a lot of effects these days are done directly in the engine. If you learn Unreal from top to bottom, you'll learn everything, pretty much everything you need to know to write a video game, except how to be a good writer. <laughs> so um, 3ds Max, Houdini, After Effects, a lot of those tools are still used, though. Uh, in their contents, uh, their assets, like imported into the game so that you can um, use them in the game. An animator, somebody brought this up before. So all this mo character movement, the dancing, the sorting, um, even the cloth flapping around like you see on him, um, 
that's in-game cinematic or in-game animation on the top there the bottom one is more more like cinematic animation um that stuff might be a combination of mocap or direct hand animation the top might be a lot of mocap probably as well in the top one by mocap i mean they take like a real actor and attach various forms of sensors onto them uh, or sometimes none at all in the fancy technology we have right uh, in the last couple of years um, and they just uh, have the actor perform a lot of these moves and then they capture that data and they use it in the game directly. However, there's still a lot of hand animation that goes on, a lot of getting right in there and keying, you know, um, frame by frame where uh, a, a character is or where an object is directly in the scene. So their job is to make realistic character and creature animation and sometimes other forms of animation like objects, machines and stuff moving around. Could be, like I said, cinematic animation like below or gameplay animation like above. This requires a typical understanding of normal animation skills such as anatomy and art in general. But also skill highly in, in some highly technical software, especially 3ds Max, Motion Builder, Blender, Houdini, Maya. Um, a lot of uh, those skills, skills in these software is highly employable across many different fields um video games movies tv effects houses all that stuff now any questions on that i know a bunch of you said artists we'll move on we'll move out of the art field i'm going to put eduardo on the spot in a second here narrative team is game writers narrative designers and perhaps a cinematics director depending on how you um count cinematics whether you count it as part of the art team or part of the writing team it can be both sometimes a game writer is what i've always been uh, but also a narrative designer so uh in this is not from the trailer that we just watched there's another one a cinematic trailer for assassin's creed mirage that has some other stuff in it that's pretty cool you can go and find that now if you want. I think I have the link for it for you. I'll, I'll bring it up to you in a minute. Uh, a game writer comes up with a story, depending on their level of seniority, obviously. They create all the characters and the ideas, the worlds, the plot points, everything that everything that happens in the story of the game. They write all the dialogue, whether that's for cinematic scripts or for game dialogue, like, you know, Ugh, somebody wrote that. No, probably not. Uh, of course, this requires like any writing job flawless writing skills perfect technical english writing well you know whatever language writing um and knowledge of storytelling as well typical straightforward you know um uh fourth year university <laughs> storytelling skills um basically anything you would imagine being a writer however as a game writer you do have some other skills that you need to pick up like interactive writing concept of choice and consequence and a little bit of game design and narrative design knowledge is helpful, depending on the type of game you're working on. A narrative designer, however, is a little more specialized. Eduardo is going to explain it for us. Thank you, Eduardo. Narrative designer is. Oh, someone. Uh, I I mean, I, I would say he works closely with like. Uh... He? I mean, no, 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 hey, no, no, I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean, they could work closely with the devil designer in a way because they have to like implement the story into gameplay because like they have to think about like what the player is actually doing in gameplay, not like, okay, that's an interesting story, but the gameplay is actually boring. Like it has, they had to complement each other in a way, you know, that's, that's, that's true. What I think good answer. Okay. Narrative designer <laughs> sort of, um, thank you. Good work. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, narrative designer kind of uh, uh, blends uh, between game design and narrative content. Sometimes they implement it directly, like going into the engine and like triggering the dialogue, uh, making so that when you click on that character, this particular conversation triggers, triggering a cinematic in a specific place and having other controls over that. Sometimes they also design interactive narrative features, such as conversation choice wheels, um, uh, uh, uh persuasion systems like we saw in the starfield trailer this weekend um other stuff like that you know like ways that you play the story with game mechanics 
You might also design dynamic in-game cinematic content. So for instance, there are many games out there where you can choose the party members that are with you at any time. Well, uh, a, a narrative designer, or sometimes what we might call a cinematic designer, will like um, do some scripting and technical work to ensure that the right characters are actually present in that cinematic. And every player that plays through that cinematic, it might look a little different, or there might be different characters in it saying different things. A narrative designer might have gotten their hands on that to make it work properly. But in essence, I'd say it ensures a link between story and gameplay. That's their job. Close, direct link. If you do this job, you're probably working in an engine directly with narrative tools and your skills and a sense of how storytelling should work without often doing a lot of the writing yourself. Now, I should say that game writers and narrative designer term, they, they, they're, it's kind of like a Venn diagram, it, depending on what company you're at. It's, it's not entirely um, well-defined yet. Narrative designer is still kind of a new term that's, that's uh, only been used really a lot in like maybe the last five to eight years. Now, a cinematics director, for those of you who are interested in animation, is like the next level up, um, especially if you have a keen understanding of storytelling, um, visual storytelling, especially in cinema, cinematography, stuff like that. Um, they, they are just like a film director in charge of directing the game cinematics. So this requires a knowledge of game engines and software and other technical stuff. Uh, but for the most part, it really is sort of like a film director, right? You would be storyboarding scenes and doing that. Often you end up going out and directly directing motion capture scenes between actors. And I've been, I've attended many of those sessions and uh, the, the game, the cinematics director is the guy in charge or person in charge. Um, you will require knowledge of how to direct actors just like you would in, in, in like film or, or acting. Uh, so also knowledge of drama and storytelling as well as cinematography, because when it comes down to it, cinematics director is the one who often ensures that the cinematics are entertaining. And that includes every single skill that you can imagine um, involved in filmmaking, helping the actors find the good performance, um, helping with blocking and cinematography, thinking about lighting, thinking about the environment design, pretty much everything when it comes down to a cinematic. <clears throat> so that's narrative. Small but mighty. Engineers are present in just about everything that you've seen. Um, but, and there's like an enormous variety of them. So specialized, some of them. I'm only going to name a couple. Gameplay programmers and graphics programmers. But I swear there's like a dozen more that I would, I would hear on a regular day around a large office. A gameplay programmer is the person that makes stuff like this actually work, sets up all of the um, you know code that sits inside the engine to let the designers trigger events like this. Designer usually comes up with an idea and the very first step that happens is a programmer starts setting about making the system actually capable of doing some sort of thing like this. Um, and also a lot of fancy other stuff too, artistic stuff to make the graphics appear nice like this, although that's a graphics programmer more. But in essence, I'd say it writes the code that allows all the gameplay features to work. Creates tools also and features that the designers and other developers need so that they can do their work. When you come up with a fancy new feature for a game, one of the first things that often happens is you think about like, do I need a tool so that I can directly control this without having to know how to write code? A programmer will often make that tool for you. This requires knowledge of coding languages um, like the ones listed there. And uh, in general, a lot of programmers, instead of having education in like game programming, although you can get that nowadays, they often come with, you know, a degree in computer science where you learn this sort of stuff. You can go, nowadays, there are lots of universities and, and schools where you can go and get uh, essentially a computer science degree specifically for video games, though, because it's such a big field now. A graphics programmer is similar, and yet also, you know, more complicated. Um, they make sure everything looks damn good. And mostly, that's mostly to do with um, writing the code that allows the game to display all of the amazing graphics without burning the house down, basically. Their, their work chiefly is to make sure that 
the game can look as good as humanly possible without lighting your console on fire. Um, yeah. So this is a focus on what we call performance and frame rate optimization, making the game look as good as it possibly can, squeezing every ounce of performance out of the machine that it's playing on. Um, like I said, without literally lighting it on fire. And it may sound like a joke, but that's that's actually real. <laughs> they really are. That's their chief job, really, is to make sure that the game. Run, and of course, it before it lights on fire and explodes, killing killing everyone you love, um, it uh, will slow down and look hideous and get choppy and crash the machines and all that. Right. Their job is to make sure that all of this beautiful visual graphics doesn't do that. Or, or explode. So, like I said, with the previous one computer science degree for the most part, especially this one. Graphics programming is one of the most complex fields and also one of the best paying uh, in the whole industry, for sure. Easily 300 grand a year. So, now audio. Audio is one of the few game fields that we don't teach at Quantlin. Um, there are lots of great places you can go to learn it, but if you want to be like deep into like sound design or like composing music for games or something, sadly, this is one of the areas that we don't specialize in yet, but we're getting to it. Sound designer. Mm, let's play that again. Embrace the fear. Quiet it. Find a stillness. Listen to this. And let's go. So much swooshes. If you like making swooshy sounds with your mouth in a booth, then you should be a sound. Actually, that's kind of a different job, but um, it happens sometimes. So um, you create, you implement, you trigger all the audio assets, especially sound effects. Huge amount of work. The um, uh, There's kind of three major categories of audio stuff. There's the music itself, which is done by traditional composers, typically. Again, with some knowledge of how game of how video games specifically work. Then there's uh, what we call like the ambient audio, which is like, you know, the sound of birds and winds and stuff and like just sort of the sound of, of the world that you're in. Uh, then there's visual sound effects, <laughs> blood splats and all that stuff, jumping and crashing and breaking people's noses with your knee, um, all that sound effect stuff. Uh, there is a fourth category that I would name, which is um, a recording of audio, or sorry, a recording of um, a dialogue. Um, there's often whole teams that are specifically specifically uh, connected to that. However, sound effects consume a great deal of the work. You might also handle voice lines, voice casting, voice directing. Depending on the size of the game, there could be a whole team unto itself. Sometimes they even go out into the field to record sounds and ambience. You'll see weirdos like standing by the side of the road with like a, a microphone, like recording traffic. Um, totally very normal. We did exactly that, I'm pretty sure, in Prototype 2, a game that I worked on ages back. There are a bunch of specific tools that only sound designers ever bother fiddling with, um, especially we say WYs or FMOD. These are the major tools that you'll learn to use. You might also learn Pro Tools. Uh, another major sound design tool set. Again, like I said, unfortunately, it's not something that we teach here yet. And of course, there's a composer who makes music. This is a pretty, this is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Um, you make music all day. You sit in your room <laughs> um, or, uh, and like put it all together on your computer, or you write a score and literally go to a recording studio with a giant orchestra and watch somebody conduct it for you. Um, or you do weird chiptune music with bleeps and bloops, sitting in your basement uh, or at a studio. All of that is valid composition work. So all kinds of music for the game, sometimes even plays the instruments or sings themselves. Um, some kind of games require much more technical music, such as themes that change slightly depending on the player's activity. More and more common now in, in all kinds of video games. And like I said, they made direct orchestras themselves. So of course, like concept art, this is a traditional form of art that 
it hasn't changed all that much um, as it's moved into video games. Am I going to get through everything? Five minutes? I can do it. Um, UI and UX. So this is slightly complex, so stay with me. A UI designer, a UX designer, and a UI artist. So a user interface designer is a person who creates and designs all the on-screen controls and the information. Um, this is a UI, we would say, a menu design. Uh, all of the special abilities that you get in, I believe this is Valhalla, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, um, I think. Uh, no, this is from Origins. This is the Egyptian one. So making this um, usable interface, basically, and making all the designs for it, uh, planning how it's going to be used, sometimes executing it directly in the various fancy um, interface tools that they have at their disposal. So menus, text, interactions with other game systems that you do on screen. So this takes knowledge of graphic design and type design, uh, as well as uh, a lot of software, especially, and here's some new ones that become very popular only in the last couple of years, Figma, ProtoPy, and Adobe XD. These are software suites designed specifically to make interfaces for software. Now, there's the designers. Oh, all right, I got ahead of myself. A slightly related variety of user experience designer or user interface designer is what we call a user experience designer. So they're the ones that figure out kind of the user flow in games. They design the user's experience often as they travel through and use interfaces uh, like this or like this. Um, this is from, I believe, uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Um, the really incredibly complex cult hunting uh, UI that you see here. So they, they like um, design the flow usually from screen to screen and how the user uses interfaces that are highly, highly complex, trying to make sure that they are, um, they can be smoothly used and that the player can intuit how they're supposed to be used so that they're not confusing, not so much whether they're beautiful or not, but whether they're usable. So this is more about the overall experience of like using the game uh, rather than any specific part of any of it. Sometimes a user experience designer essentially designs the flow of like the entire game, not just the interface. But to be honest, I wouldn't expect to see a user experience designer except on a game where there was a lot of complicated interfaces and menus. They also design stuff in Figma and ProtoPy and Adobe XD. This is something we teach at Quantlin. A user interface artist, however, is back again to making stuff look pretty. Still technical, but they're the ones that are like, you know, um, how do we make this boring encyclopedia look cool? So then a user interface artist would be like, well, I understand your designs. So in the background, let's put this and let's use um, this shadowing on this part here and let's make this glow and let's use this. I recommend this font and let's have this parchment background and this kind of overlay, making it look nice, basically. So making the user interface attractive. I know a guy who does this for a living and he's obsessed with it. It's like his favorite thing in the world to just like make UIs look cool. Um, so this, again, is graphics art skills, but also a lot of classical illustration skills, and a lot of different 2D art skills. Sometimes also fancy 3D and VFX gimmickry to make it all look awesome. Like, for instance, this character uh, in the UI actually like dances around and punches and stuff. So, but it also requires a lot of artistic skills with superior familiarity with art tools, especially Photoshop, because a great deal of the mocking up uh, the like um, prototyping of what the interfaces look like uh, is done in Photoshop still to this day. Now I'm going to hustle a little, but I'd be okay to hang around for a couple of minutes to answer some questions if you want. But for the most part, we're almost done. The hybrids are complex. Technical artist, world designer, engagement designer, and a system designer. There's even more than this, but these are my four favorites at the moment. A technical artist is the person who makes the technical components of game art 
Uh, they may rig up a character so that the animation will work. Rigging is one of the most classic and oldest forms of what we can what we call technical art. But they might also do other stuff like setting up, you know, uh, what happens when uh, water and particles land on the character. Um, they'll design the hair so that it makes the hair like flow and look normal. They'll do fur on animals so that it blows around in the wind. Um, dynamic clothing like the, the flapping uh, fabric on this character. They will often liaise essentially between the art and the programming teams, themselves kind of being a hybrid between art and programming and lots of other strange skills. Um, this requires the knowledge of artistic aesthetics, uh, but also programming, which, if you can imagine, sounds like a strange combination. Uh, and uh, in a lot of ways, this is what makes technical artists extremely desirable right now. Um, so, yeah, they often have to know. They are they are often the real experts about how an engine works to deliver visuals into a game. I have a couple of people graduating from the sixth term right now, uh, hoping to go into technical art. A world designer. Oh, man, what a strange combo. They do some of the coolest stuff right now. Um. They use tools and design skills and technical knowledge to generate usually very large environments, large open world environments like what you see in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, right? No level designer sat down and put every and like crafted every one of these hills into like perfect precision, right? There are procedural scientific tools um, that automatically generate uh, most of this stuff, all this space, place all of the plants randomly place rocks, randomly place resources for the player to make use of. And as you can see in the top video, sometimes even like make tools that are the things that generate the look of the of landscapes the size of an entire planet. I guarantee you on Starfield, no level designer sat down and made 1,000 planets. That is their claim that that game has 1,000 fully explorable planets. So obviously a computer has been involved to generate all that space. An engagement designer is becoming all more common nowadays. So you see these things? Season passes, battle passes, expansions and updates, things you must buy. I'm shocked right now. I mean, like right after I finish this, I'm going to go play Diablo. And the first thing you see when you log in is the shop. They're like, buy me, buy me now, right? So um, designing what it is that the player will be engaged with over a long period of time. And typically that basically just means designing um, what they're going to buy, right? What are the things that we're going to buy a little extra to keep us engaged for a longer period of time? Usually years, right? That's kind of the goal is like, what do we need to give them or attract them with so that they'll keep coming back? And when they keep coming back, what do they spend more money on? So yeah, like I said, their main job is to encourage players to spend a little more money on the game, really. Um, even if it's as simple as like, let's just keep them interested for as long as possible. The main reason we would do that on a game is to make them come back and just spend either a little more money or a lot more money. Another term for this job is what I've seen called a product manager. So that obviously sounds even more like a job that's about making people spend money. Eight oh four. I didn't quite get all the way through. It was ambitious. Uh, I've only got four slides left. If you have to go, you can go. Um, this is being recorded, so you can stop and watch the rest. But if you got to bail, you can bail now. I won't take it personally. But if you've got 10 more minutes, I can show you the rest. Otherwise, thank you for coming. And uh, you can the, the video will be posted of this, um, I don't know where, somewhere. <laughs> Uh, I believe on the um, the channel where we where, where you heard about this in the first place, and I think it's also going to be on YouTube when it's done. Which I'm trying not to think about. So producers are often kind of in two two major categories: producers and project managers. This is also something that we don't quite teach yet uh, at Quantlin, but we are very seriously considering it, and they're probably going to make me teach it, which is very irritating, but. Um, it is a job that often is um, uh, uh, not about making anything at all, strangely. Um, you can't even see them in the trailers. 
this is them in the trailers, basically. You, you can't see them in the trailer. They're hidden um, because they're managing the entire team and maintaining all the lines of communication between all the different teams. They ensure that the team has the right people often in the right positions. And they, a lot of the time, end up making kind of like the big decisions about the game from a business perspective. If you fancy yourself sort of like a promoter, you know, uh, a person that can build a team, keep it together, keep everybody happy and execute on a rad concept, like a big project, maybe you should be a producer. Um, and there are a lot of them on some games. Uh, on the game I'm on, we don't even have one right now. I mean, like, technically, I'm the project manager. Um, but big games will have like dozens of these people, dozens of producers. You might hear them called middle managers. That's the mean term. But in reality, they're like the glue that keeps the game working and the intelligence network that keeps things going forward. So this is very much about people skills, right? You have to be able to know how to handle people, help people, make them feel better about what they're doing, um, and be approachable enough that they'll tell you when something's going wrong. They're also well-paid, typically, because in a way, they're kind of like the leadership a lot of the time. If you're a producer, you're on the road, very, very quick, fastest road possible, really, to becoming the person who's in charge of the whole game. Project manager is a related job. Um, here's a pretty good representation of what a project manager does. They keep the game on schedule. They're not in charge of like smacking anybody if they're uh, if the person uh, gets behind. Um, but they are basically, uh, they maintain a scheduling database and software of some sort. Man, back in the day before COVID, this is literally what project managers would do. Post-it notes on a whiteboard, everybody hanging around talking about what all the tasks are that we have to do to get the job done. Nowadays, a great deal of this is done more directly in uh, production software. Um, like Kanban or Trello or Asana or any number of a million other programs that are used to like manage uh, tasks, like this sort of thing. Like I said, we some, we used to be, I, mean, I remember working before we ever had a digital solution for tracking tasks. Um, we would do it on a big whiteboard just like this. We did it at EA about five years ago, but that has gone the way of the dodo, partially now with uh, with COVID. So the project manager is really the glue that keeps the team on schedule. They're not, they're only concerned about paying attention to whether you were falling behind or not and reporting that to the producers. There's a project manager usually on every single team uh, on a game, keeping track of everything that's going on. And like I said, that's my, one of my jobs currently right now, in addition to being the narrative director. So those are all the major roles, art, design, sound, engineering, programming. No, and I said engineering, but programming, and I missed somebody. Uh, narrative, oh my God, I missed my own department. And of course, new skills and roles are always arising because technology is always improving and things are getting more specialized and weirder and the business keeps changing. Um, there are many things on the horizon um, that are gonna require specialists. Um, Especially how you use AI inside of a game, that's a big deal. And extended reality like our, you know, VR, AR, XR, um, different ways to, to um, use a game, basically. Different ways to see a game or to engage with a game. These things don't really have job roles right now, but they're, they're coming soon and will be codified and clarified soon. So how do you get started doing any of these things? Well, first off, you got to pick your flavor because in general, I mean, like, unless you're some, one of those like really weird mutants that knows how to do literally everything on a game. And trust me, there are a lot of them. Um, there, there are some out there. It's very rare to find someone that knows how to do everything on a game. And typically those people start as engineers. They're engineers with a great deal of artistic skill, but they know the substructure of how to make software. And as a result, they have the most important skill. Um, and they can add on all of the artistic skills and creative skills that they need. But engineers pretty much have to go to university to learn how to do that stuff. Unless you were some weird like high school hacker that figured out how to order like a thousand pizzas to the school. And then you're well on your way 
um, to being an engineer. But for the most part, people have to go to university to learn that stuff. Once you've got that skill, you can make a video game. What's in it is uh, hard to say, but you can get a lot of these other skills uh, you can pick up over time. But the, but the engineers are the ones that know how to make a game from scratch. Everyone else relies on the engineers to actually do it. So you may need to do some research on where you can learn it. At the CEA, which is a sort of subsection of KPU, uh, probably the CEA won't even exist next year, I, I, I predict, and will just be Kwantlen um, ENTA department. Uh, we teach all of this, except audio. You're going to learn a little bit of gameplay and gameplay programming. You're going to learn a little UI design. You learn, you learn a little bit about production because I teach a class on project management, essentially, in rapid game dev. Um, you, know, you can learn narrative stuff. You can learn art. You can learn. I don't know if we teach any extended reality like AR or VR. I don't think so. It, we, we, we do. Yeah. Do you? Oh, cool. Yeah, we have class for that right now. That's awesome. Okay, so like almost all of this you can learn except audio. And really like deep, hardcore software engineering. You got to go to university for that. Um, I myself, I teach. I have a particular focus on game design, production, and narrative. But there are lots of others, lots of other instructors that have their specialties and things. Um, but like I said, don't wait for us. Many games have tools that you can start using like right now, and most of the engines are actually free. You just download them, and like, you know, there's, 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 there's nothing that can quite replace like getting into a classroom and doing projects and like working with other people and all that. But you can also get a Udemy course for like $30 and learn some of the basics of Unreal, for example. Um, or you can get really nerdy about modding for games. A lot of games come with their own modding tools and they're relative, they're uh, easier to learn and can get you get your foot um, in the water and you can learn uh, more. Uh, you can learn something at least about how to make a game. That's how I got into it initially, was modding for old Neverwinter Nights from 20 years ago. So there are ways, there are back doors. Or you could come and get a hardcore education um, at, at uh, Kwaman. That's it. I got to the end. It's only 8.12. So thank you, everyone, for hanging out a little longer. Um, it was ambitious of me to get 35 slides in on one hour. Um, but for the most part, we, 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 we had enough time, I think. Do you have any questions? Do you have anything you want to ask about all these roles and positions? Or do you just want to go and play Diablo as soon as possible? Okay, I, I have a question. I mean, <laughs> if we were to, like, put into a... How do I explain that? If we were to put into a list, which, like... Which one of the roles would you think it's easier for someone that's starting in the industry right now to get into? And which one is the hardest? Because like mm -hmm. people have different skills and people have like they, they can merge different skills just to get in first and then after after that develop what they're actually gonna do. Because I hear that like designers or narrative uh designers are kind of it's kind of hard to get like right away, like right after school, you know. You mean like get a career? They got a career, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Every one of these fields has like its own weird idiosyncrasies with regards yeah. to that, right? Like narrative is funny because there are so few jobs. Um, each sometimes a team of a thousand people only has like one or two people doing working, you know, working in that entire department, right? Um, but then again, there's also not as many people interested in doing that directly, working in game narrative. If you're a writer, typically you're like, I want to write TV or something like that. Um, Engineers, of course, it's, it's it's hard to get one of those jobs for a couple of reasons. They're very highly paid, so they're scrutinized heavily, the people that they hire. Um, but also, but to counter that, they often need quite a lot of them, and they're always hiring. Every, every company site you look at, guaranteed they have engineer positions. In fact, they need them so badly that they basically just leave those positions open forever. They never close them because they're always needing someone. And God forbid they run out of engineers, they just stop being able to make the video game. So um, in a way, being an engineer is incredibly hireable. That said, the bar to get one of those jobs is pretty high. You have to demonstrate an incredible amount of technical skill, and you got to go to some hardcore school, uh, usually, to, to get them. I have worked with people who are like making swords swing around and like 
you know, making the sparks look cool and they're bloody doctors of computer science, you know? So the competition for those jobs is really high. There are a lot of those jobs, but the competition is very high. And um, like I said, the companies are very picky about who they put in those positions. Now, okay. If your question is, what's the easiest way to get into making video games? It's a whole other department I don't even have listed here, which is QA, right? So now anybody in QA probably kind of mad at me that I didn't put them on this list. <clears throat> um, so um, I apologize, but QA is called uh, quality assurance uh, or sometimes we call it QDev nowadays because it sounds nicer. Uh, but basically that job is the testing of the game to make sure that it actually works. And so, yeah, you might think I'm saying game tester and I am, and QA is slightly glorified uh, term for that. But the fact is coming into becoming a game tester is like very, um, a very junior position, very easily accessible. They require an absolute mountain of people to do it. Um, at its most entry level, you could work for what we might call like a QA farm or a testing farm where you go to work with like a thousand other people to test a video game and you have your own specific part of it that you have to test and you make documentation about what you find that's broken and all that kind of stuff. It's incredibly easy to get one of those jobs as long as you like can read and write and, um, you know, have an understanding of video games and you interview well enough. Right. Um, now, it may make it sound like I'm saying that's the like, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, like retail version of getting into video games. But in fact, almost everybody that I know who is like a really hardcore game designer, they got into it from entering QA first. And so what happens is they get into QA and they um, learn a great deal about how a game is made and they start to get a grasp of like the greater ecosystem of a game, a game, de game development team. And then they shift over eventually. They find something they really like. They get really into it. They learn a lot about it. And they just sort of eventually say, I would like to stop being QA. I would like to become a junior game designer or an associate game designer or very commonly an associate producer, something like that. And you just sort of merge over. You sort of ooze over onto the team that you want to be on. So many people that I know were in QA first because it's just the damn easiest way to get in. You don't need any kind of education for it. Um, however, many people who go to like a game college of some sort, um, or, or, or like, you know, like Quantlin, although I think our program is a little advanced, honestly, for, for, I hope not, not a lot of our students end up going directly into QA, but find a job in the field that they want to be in instead of QA. Not, not to say that QA isn't a field that people are in. QA managers are like highly paid people and very specialized and have a lot of technical knowledge about how to make game design test plans and stuff. Um, <clears throat> but for the most part, people enter QA and then they eventually leave it to go into some other department. Often an artistic or creative area like writing or art or design or audio or into the making of the game, more like a producer. Who handle a lot of the complexities of like how to make the game actually um, uh, uh, sell and be popular and successfully be completed which of course is one of the most important skills um, in game design, in, in game development. Holy God, I can talk sometimes. Hey, Eduardo, you agree? Yeah, yeah, it's all right. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, like I said, your easiest way in is QA. The harder way in is to specialize in the area that you like the most. Um, you asked me like, what's the easiest way to get in? To be honest, like for me, I never could have done QA um, because I wasn't interested in that. I didn't want to do that. I came in directly as a writer. Yeah, because like I'm really interested in level design, but I was talking to some other designers and they do say that like you shouldn't do ways either Q, Q, Q and a or like going to like uh, arts, going to the artist path first, like making props and modeler and then I eventually go to a designer role. Because it's difficult That's, to I mean, go right off the gates. Like, I don't know about that. Or, you know. That sounds a little strange to me. But I mean, I don't um, know. <laughs> Q, like QA into virtually any one of these other departments is quite possible. Mm -hmm. Depending All upon right. what other skills you're working on or developing on your own or whatever you're interested in. 
the, the second answer to what is the easiest job to get into <laughs> is the one that you're most passionate about. Um, then you have the commitment to put up with potentially more school, lots of applying for jobs, lots of hunting for jobs. If you're committed to it enough, you will move anywhere in the world to do it. And that itself is a strong, uh, you know, an important job skill. When I was looking to get into games, uh, game writing, man, if I just moved to Shanghai, I probably could have done it 10 years earlier because for some reason they were just like Ubisoft is hiring like tons of writers in Shanghai, probably for all the Assassin's Creed games. I know they do a great deal of their like side quest and side writing content. Um, if you're comfortable with moving somewhere, your job opportunities open up vastly. But like I said, to me, like to me, but that I'm a creative person. I'm less of an opportunist, really. I didn't want to just work in games, you know, like I wanted to do what I wanted to do, which is I wanted to write video games. It means I had to wait a little longer to find just the right position and put up with a lot of rejection until I found the right way in. I didn't have to put up with that much rejection, but a little bit more than a medium amount. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, yes. Um, well, when you said optimization earlier for modeling, can you be more specific about that? I don't know. Eduardo might be able to answer this better than me because to be honest, I'm not like, I don't have any direct technical experience really much at all. Um, I'm a game designer and a narrative designer and a writer chiefly, right? Sometimes when you really are like purely in that area, you literally never enter the engine or do anything in any software at all other than word. Um, <clears throat> that's probably true for, for that's true ish for me. I've entered the engine now and then to do the odd thing. Um, but only when I was really bored or very irritated with my managers, I would go and do something else. Um, what was the question? Oh yeah. What am I talking about with optimization? optimization. Okay. So like, uh, the models that you would use in, um, uh, 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 movies and stuff are highly uh, detailed, right? Sometimes they have, um, like the, the surfaces are like, you know, 7 million uh, polygons, you know, uh, to make it look as smooth and perfect as possible. But in video games, the triangle count is king, right? Um, still to this day in terms of models and things. So trying to bring down the model's complexity to the minimum possible while still looking good is an obsession with especially character artists, character modelers. Um, you, you always see, you know, uh, like if you look on ArtStation and you see somebody's like game concept design, then they'll be like, here's the model. Uh, and they'll list specifically how many triangles are on the model to give you a sense of like how complex the model is. So like I would say, like optimizing things is really important. Now, optimizing models is like, how do we have it as few surfaces as possible? But there's lots of other optimization that happens too. Um, reducing the file size, basically, of every single possible thing. High performance models, right? Trim texture sheets. Yeah. Making sure your textures are the proper resolution and small enough in size so that, that it's not so hard to render them. Um, smart materials, right? Like uh, like procedural materials and stuff that are driven by programs and, and the engine in game itself. Rather than being directly painted by someone. Eduardo knows more about this, more about this than I do. And most people do in video games, to be honest. But <clears throat> all right, what else? Thank you. And Eduardo, you're term five now? Yeah, term five. Term five, yeah. There's six terms altogether, right? Yes. Yeah. Last term. Next. The last term. Yeah. Next term. So going through like the advanced game program, you learn like such a variety of skills and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you have a pretty good handle on almost all of the little things. Yeah. And uh, Janelle and friend, are you in the program? Yeah, I'm in 3D animation, same term as Eduardo, and my sister is. I'm at BCIT in the computer right. systems diploma. I won't teach you in 3D, so you'll never get my cool class. <laughs> no. But I teach advanced in the advanced game program, so. Yep. Eduardo is telling me about your class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Only good comments, don't worry. <laughs> I don't care. 
All right. <laughs> I have to remember this is being recorded. <laughs> I can't be as casual as I am in my class. Did you notice how I didn't even swear once, Eduardo? I deserve, like, you should send a, a thumbs up to Ed for me That's on true. that. Thumbs and up. <laughs> um, okay. I should probably let you all go. Because I have Diablo to play, and I hope you have things to do, too. Work. More important things, probably. <laughs> um, yeah. So, any last questions? All right, then. Good luck with the career. I hope to I hope to share a cubicle with you someday. Thank you, Jeffrey. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'll stop this recording somehow. How do I do that? Just, just,